Vous avez cloché les? Hello, everybody. Let's welcome people watching us from home. Hello, everyone. Wave to them, wave to them. Okay. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Take your seat. And um, we're going to continue our class today. We're going to be talking about truth. How many of you remember what we spoke about truth yesterday? Okay. Yeah? Do you remember? Please come and tell me. You have the microphone? Give me a small summary of what you understand from yesterday. Come stand here. Uh, well, I remember that you told us yesterday about the truth and that you have your truth and no one, um, whoever it is, uh, whatever he says to you, this is uh, nothing because if you know that something is truth, this is the truth. And uh, you should not be scared because uh, if you know the truth, truth is before you and uh, God with you. And uh, truth is the most important thing in one of the most important things in our life. Yep. After willpower. <laughs> and um, and probably you always should tell truth because if uh, you are lying and uh, then someone knows you're lying and it is um, a little bit uncomfortable and yeah. God says that you shouldn't lie and yeah. that you should tell the truth. Oh. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, yesterday we were, um, you were talking about. I'm sure you will need to speak louder because uh, some people were complaining this morning that your voices were not loud enough. She spoke loud enough, but you need to speak loud enough. Um, yesterday you were talking about um, people. Um, when that when people when um you try to tell someone the truth, they always try to find um excuses for um doing the wrong thing. Alternative explanations. Remember that word. Alternative explanations. Uh, alternative explanations. Yeah. And because they know it's the truth and they don't want to hear it or have to explain for what they did for themselves, they make excuses of their own and do also um remember what Paul was saying as well about that um you, god isn't something that you can put in the lab um because the lab um, um science is described as um what um what man see about the earth or what they learn about the earth and that it, people will always try to deceive you about the truth and try to um, make you do what they want you to do but you must always stand on your side of the truth <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anybody ready to speak? To tell us more? Yeah, please. No, yeah, this here. Start from here. So, what I got, what I, what I remember is that, as um, Sydney said, you're always going to be faced, um, people are always going to try to explain away the truth. There's always going to be alternative explanations. And um, because of this, you have to stand. Oh, okay. Because of this, you have to stand um, strongly. Yalo wale shera show golos unik me no unik tiki golos ude udete. Mutak to mojana special natam. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, um, and because of this, you have to. Um, be strong in your truth and you have to really believe in your truth oh. because 
your truth, um, when you stand on the side of the truth, you stand on the side of God. And um, when you stand on the side of God, you have a whole army behind you, even though people may not see it. It may not be seen with the naked eye, but the, there's always going to be someone backing you. And it doesn't matter how many people, it doesn't matter if the whole world is against you, you should um, present your truth, but don't be aggressive with it, don't be violent with it. You should... When, when people are trying to shame you, you should, you should um, laugh and, um, or, and just make sure you're, you're strong in your truth because if not, you're going, um, people are, you're going to be swept away by what they are saying and you're going to think that what they're saying is all right when really they are lies. Okay, thank you. I know that person. Yeah, please come. Yes. <clears throat> Yesterday we talked about alternative explanations and that whatever truth you have, people are going to reject it. And one of the most common ways for people to reject it is to make up alternative explanations for the truth. So you could have a truth. Because of that truth, there are some other things. But people will say, yes, these things are here, but they're because of this or they're this way. And people will always try to do that. And so it's our job to stand for the truth, even if it makes them feel uncomfortable, even so if it that, might... Who was that with Norman? Or so? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Uje Norman, Uje Karasham. Even if it might make you feel uncomfortable, you just have to submit to the truth. You just have to be in total submission to the truth and rooted in the truth. And for that reason, you shouldn't let anything that they throw at you because they'll try to use authority and they'll try to use appeal to emotions and they'll try to make up any excuses and throw them at you. But you should never be able to be faced by that because you are so established in the truth. But also that you should also be warring with your truth because people will try and explain away your truth and what God has put in you. So that means that you have to be aggressively working on yourself or aggressively loving or aggressively being peaceful so that you can make a bolder say, statement of truth then that will be able to counter the alternative ex explanations that are always going to pop up. Okay. Well, I'm going to keep on talking on the truth today. And um, the basic topic this week that I'm, I'm addressing is called uh, why people reject the truth. Uh, there are many reasons why people reject the truth. And let me remind you of some of the points that we already spoke about. People reject the truth mainly because an authority... Authority, author, authority figure had spoken lies to them and they have believed the lie. Or the, an authority, authority figure has told them that they shouldn't listen to the truth. So, so most of the time we don't really believe things because they are truth, but we believe things because people we respect told us that we should believe it or we shouldn't believe it. We actually mostly believe what people would expect tell us to believe. So that is with the role of authority figure. And that's the bad thing in the authority, in not finding out the truth for yourself. If you just follow what the authority figure will say, that could lead you astray. Because most of the time we believe not the truth. But you should be more careful to follow and search out the truth to make sure that you are always following truth rather than what people tell you, even if they are authority figure. Then the next thing we say is that authority is good. We had another topic that says authority is good, but credibility is better. Look for credibility of whatever an authority figure is telling you. Yes, we respect authority. We respect leaders. But we always must look for the credibility to whatever they are saying. And only after we have found out the confirmation and the credibility or the truthfulness of whatever they are telling us, then we believe it. So that way, we know we are standing on solid ground. The next reason why people reject the truth is because the truth might be contrary to their belief system. 
when people find that the, the truth is contrary to their belief systems, they normally fight it. They normally fight the truth. And uh, because of pride and because, you know, of dogma, because people are conservative and things like that. So the next reason why people uh, reject the truth is because the truth they feel could, might offend them. People feel whatever you are saying is offensive to them. For example, when you speak to a Muslim that he needs to become a Christian, he might see that as offensive. So when people f think that the truth you are bringing to them is offensive, they tend to reject that truth rather than to humble themselves and receive the truth. Next point uh, is that many people think that they have, they might not, many people might not like the source of the truth that you are bringing. If they feel that they don't like the source of the truth, they don't like you, or they don't like your style, or they don't like where that truth is coming from, or what angle it's coming from, they might also want to or turn, have the tendency to reject the truth. Another reason why people reject the truth is because they have alternative explanations. That's what we went through yesterday. They have an alternative explanation, and that alternative explanation make them to want to kind of reject the truth that, you are, that is being taught to them. Um, but today, I'm going to be talking on another factor that makes people to want to reject the truth that you present to them. And that factor is the fact that uh, people you are talking the truth to might sometimes think that they, uh, that they have other evidences or they have other evidences or another evidence or other evidences to what you are saying or against what you are saying or to counter what you are saying. So many people might think, well, what, whatever you are saying is good, but they, might, they think that they actually have another or better uh, evidence to prove the opposite or to prove uh, the, yeah, to prove the opposite of what you have just told them. Like, for example, if you want to, let's use the example of a Muslim also. If you want to win to, uh, over a Muslim to your side, you want to evangelize a Muslim person. And you are telling them, Jesus Christ is the only way. Jesus is the only way. What do you think a Muslim guy will say? Why do, what do you think a Muslim person will say? Come and say, take the microphone. I think the Muslim would be like, why would you say that to me when you know I'm a Muslim? And don't you think I've heard about this before? This is all over the world. Yeah, but what is going to be his counter argument? What is he going to say? When you say see, Jesus is the only way, what will he say? Allah is the only way. Huh? Allah is the only way. He will, he will say Allah or Muhammad is the only way. It's because you are saying Jesus, he will say Allah or Muhammad. So what does that mean? That is referring to another evidence. Another evidence. So, you know, you have a fact, an evidence of what you are saying, and he will come together with another evidence. So that might be another reason why people reject the truth. And we are going to be dealing with, well, okay, what that, when that happens, what should we do? Now, are they, do you know other examples why when you talk to people about God or about truth in general, do you know, or all of you, this is a question to all of you. Do you can you people tell me other instances, apart from what I just gave you, the example I just gave you, what are the other instances or examples when people would normally give you an alternative evidence or other evidences to counter whatsoever truth that you are trying to tell them. What are the evidences people would normally give? Yes. Um, I think one of the most common ones is with like creation and how if what, you say, what? if you say like creation. Okay. So like if you say um, God created the universe and the earth, they'll be like, oh yeah, but you know the Big Bang happened a couple billion years ago. Yeah, beautiful. And That's another beautiful, uh, another beautiful example. People will always, you talk about creation, people will always tell you about, uh, what, what do you call it? The evolution. Yeah. They will tell you about evolution. 
which is another evidence from their own point of view. And they have their own facts. Now, these are the things people say, and it's important for you to know. So for you as kids, you must know that the world is not waiting for you. And the world is not waiting for you with an embrace. Oh, come with the truth, okay, especially truth about God. You are going to face hostility. People are going to dispute whatsoever truth you're coming with. Even if you have great uh, uh, evidences or great arguments, just for you to know, it's normal. It's normal that people will come with alternative evidence. But when they come with the alternative evidence, just listen to them, give them the benefit of a doubt, make sure that you give them a chance to speak their mind, let them bring out the opposing evidence they have, don't go ahead and fight them immediately. Don't go ahead and begin to dispute with them. Don't go ahead and begin to argue and immediately. No, no, there, there's a time for everything. Listen to them, then I will tell you what to do to, you know, come counter and to come out of the situation victorious. So, but before then, um, apart from evolution, creation and evolution, what are the other examples that you people could think of of people uh, coming up with other evidences or with different, no, alternative evidences or opposing evidences to the truth that you are presenting to them. Yeah. Always move faster between there and here. There is the debate to, as to whether or not abortion no, Can come again? There is the debate of abortion as to whether or not it's inhumane or immoral or should be illegal okay. because it's the mur murder of an unborn child. But other people will say, well, no, it's not the murder of an unborn child. It's not a human yet. Or, you know, it was created in a way that isn't really fair for the person that got it. So it's actually more humane to abort it. Oh, oh. So that is another evidence that people come out. When you talk about death, killing of ki kids, is, is it not strange and outrageous that human beings, we actually have alternative evidences that we come our way or have arguments? That's like unbelievable. It's crazy. It's like the most sac sacred thing should be children. And for some, but, and, but still, even when you think it's so obvious, People will still be there that will come up with, you know, alternative evidences. Absolutely so. Absolutely so. Okay. Any other person there? To yeah. Um, this has happened to me a lot. Like louder, a little bit. Okay. This has happened to me a lot. Like um, this girl that's in my school. I used to call her my friend, but she's okay. But um. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So um, she comes from a Catholic family, but she turned atheist on her, and she decided to be pansexual. And she decided, and she, yeah, pansexual means that you like everyone, as in transsexuals, um, girls, boys, doesn't matter. So she said that she wanted to be. She, I mean, well, she's pansexual, right? And um, she, I remember her. We were having this conversation because um, it was during RE, like a few years ago. We were having this conversation about God, and she was like, um, and she wasn't, and she wasn't doing any work. She wasn't writing any of it down, and because it was about Christians at the time, and I was like, why aren't she writing anything down? And she's like, I don't believe in that crap. Like, why would I believe in that? Like, and then she asked the most stupid question. <laughs> okay, so she said, um, oh, if there's a really, really a God, then why don't you see him when we're on planes? <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> and I was just, I was just shocked. Like, so you expect to see an invisible God when you're in, when you're in the air. Okay, but yeah, it was just really something that I was just wondering. Like, is this girl serious? And is, is, and it's actually something things that people think about. And I didn't realize it was possible for someone to actually think like that until she said it. So that's one of the things that might come. People will ask you, 
will try to have um, to come back at you with logic that doesn't even make sense, and you just have to. And my response to it was just I just kept quiet because I can't I I, I don't know how to answer to such yeah, exactly she just embarrassed herself so um I just I didn't know how to answer that so I just I just kept quiet so that's that's what happened to me okay so that is another example of when we come up with the truth to be prepared and to always know that there will always be somebody there that will come up with other evidences or opposing evidences. And they will have some evidences that they will use. Any other example like that? Any other person wants to tell us other examples of opposing evidences to truth that people normally use? Please. Um, just, uh, yeah, some of the evidences people might come up with might be incomplete or unbiased. I mean, or biased or downright just, you know, stupid. But uh, lots of people, for example, with racism, people will say, like, well, see, as you can see, black people, they aren't equal to white people because, see, there's less of them in government or something, and so they're less smart. Or, like, in, uh, in science. Mm -hmm. And or, or and they'll just say, see, they can do emotional things and they can run. They're like animals, but there's no scientists that are black. So that means that black people have no brains. And I've heard that argument even on about talk. Yeah, th th lots of people actually believe that. See, there's no black scientist people. That means they have no brains. You know, they're just a lower level of humankind. And people believe that. So, yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Um, in school, we were learning about we were learning about RE and about who? we were learning RE and uh, RE RE. Oh, religion. oh, okay, okay, okay. And we um the topic was about Buddhism, Buddhist Buddhism, and some of the Christians Buddhism. Yeah. Okay. Some of the Christians there didn't um. Um, didn't really want to learn that um, religion, so they started ignoring the lesson and closing their ears, and saying, "Why should I believe? Why should I listen to this um, to this religion and how they do their things when I'm a Christian and I have a different one?" Okay, what do you think about that? It is a bit true, but they should accept the fact that everybody has their own religion and that um, we learn about it in school just to know all the different kinds of religions people have. Yes, and when you learn about them, about other religions, then you too will be able to have your own uh, opposing evidences so that when you know about Buddhism and anybody wants to talk to you about Buddhism next time, you know enough to be able to come up with a counter argument or alternative explanation of your own or other opposing facts that or evidence that you could use to actually counter the argument of Buddhism or any other religion. So it's, also, it's not bad to actually learn about other religion. Sometimes it's good because it gives you a good standing so that you'll be able to present your own argument, counter-argument, either alternative explanations or uh, opposing views, opposing evidences in a more convincing way, in a more convincing manner. Okay. Anybody else want to say anything about that? Yep. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's regarding the Muslim thing you were saying the other time. Um, because one of my colleagues is a Muslim, and um, because when he, he told me that um, a Christian, that we don't have complete, um, complete way of serving God, he said, I should go and listen to their Islamic thing. So I told him that I'm not going to have any argument with you, but do you know that Jesus 
is the way, the truth, and life. He kept, I said, do you know Jesus? He said, yes, I know Jesus. Jesus is part of the prophet and all that. I said, forget about that. But Jesus is the truth, the life, I mean, the truth and life, the only way. He said, okay, well, yes, it might be. And so he couldn't say anything again. I said, I don't want to have any discussion. If you don't have Jesus, that means you're not going to be with God because it's the only way through which you can know God. So that, he kept quiet. He, he couldn't argue with me. Okay. So that, that was the only thing. Yeah. All right. Who else? I know that person wants to say anything. I think it's Pastor David who wants to say something. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just thought I'll add this. Uh, people say, well, if there is God, how come there's so much suffering in the world? I'm sure you've heard that. Um, and that's what a lot of young people come across. And, and how we respond to that. I'm sure Pastor Sunday will um, help us with that this evening. Okay. Yeah, so that's another, another way of looking at it. That's another thing people say, for sure. People mention that a lot. They say, why do, they have, why do we have wars? Why do we have hunger? Why do we have bad things happening in the world? Any other person want to say anything about this? Okay. So let me give you other examples of people trying to find alternative arguments or evidences to the truth. Like, for example, do you remember this instance, the situation whereby Moses went to the mountain to be with God? And uh, while he was away in the mountain, he left his brother Aaron on the ground. And Aaron was supposed to manage and keep the people. But the people put so much pressure on Aaron so that Aaron would come up with an alternative evidence of God. Because Moses was always producing the evidence of God with his rod and everything, but he was no more there. And people, so it is a natural tendency with people. Just know that when, when you are presenting the truth and people are coming up with uh, alternative or uh, opposing evidences, just relax and know this is just the nature of people. People cannot live without some explanation or without some proofs. And, you know, they, they, are, they are coming up with alternative things upon which they base their lives and that they use to comfort themselves and that they use to give themselves some, some peace of mind in the meanwhile. But it's still not the truth. And uh, we, we will soon find out how to deal with that, uh, with with the with the, with, the, with with those kind of people who are now to use the truth to convince them or win the argument. Now, let me give you another example before we do that. Do you remember the story of uh, the spies? The story of the spies. And Jesus, I mean God, actually sent out how many spies? How many of you remember? Twelve spies. God sent out twelve spies. And to God told them to go conquer the land. Which means it is really possible to conquer the land. But instead of them going to conquer the land, they, Satan presented them with opposing evidences. Opposing evidence. And do you know what happened? Who could tell me what happened? Some of the sky... Okay, go ahead and tell us what happened. Um, what happened was when they got back, ten of the spies said that the land is full of like giants and um, mighty warriors, and there's no way that they can get through and become like the dominators of the land. But um, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, um, they were the only two that said that they have the ability to take over the land and become the rulers of the land. And because they were the only two that believed that. With God's help, they could like overthrow all of the kingdoms in the promised land. They were the only two that were able to go into it. So I guess it's like instead of seeing the popular um, view that is an, altern an alternative to the truth, instead of following what the crowd thinks, 
is right if you stay with what you what you know is the truth and stay on what God says, um, then you'll reap the rewards of your faith. Okay, so what do you think happened in that particular situation? Um, when, well, they were all faced with the same... What are those people, those 10 people, what happened to them? <clears throat> they believed the lie that... They believed... The alternative evidence. Yeah. The opposing evidence. Mm. So does that explain to you now why somebody could come from a Christian home yeah. or from a Christian country and still fall back away from God yeah. and begin to believe something totally opposite mm. what is being taught yeah. or what is the truth? Mm -hmm. Can you exp explain that dynamic to me or anybody else would like to explain why that kind of thing happened on the basis of this story? Um, I guess in terms of this story and also in real life, like how you're saying people come from Christian homes and they still fall, um, I guess it's because they, even though they were brought up like to believe in God and trust him through the trials and tribulations of life, it can seem very overwhelming when um, your opinion that it's going to get better is the most unpopular one. So they tend to just um, fall and agree with the crowd to be accepted. So, um, like, I've seen so many videos of, like, people who were like, oh, I used to be Christian, but then this happened, and now I don't believe in God anymore. Or um, I went through this, and now I know that God doesn't exist because he didn't help me through it or whatever. So it's like, I think in terms of the story, because they saw the opposition they were faced with, they immediately doubted there was any possibility of them like having the strength to overcome it. So the alternative um, evidence seemed more possible for them in that sense. Okay, so do, was, were there, can, can anybody answer this question? Were there some understandable reasons why those 10 spies? Because 10, that was the majority. For the majority to actually go to the opposite direction, there must be some convincing and overwhelming reasons why they did that. So were there some overwhelming evidences or reasons or some arguments that, could actually, that we could actually say yes, that is the reason why these people believed and moved to the other side. Is there, is there any just no, not really justifiable? What are the arguments? What convinced ten out of twelve? What will you people say about that? Yeah. Well, when they came into the promised land, they saw, they felt fear because they saw some giants and they thought we could never stand up to those. And because of the overwhelming fear they, that, they, that they felt, it's for the, it took the place of faith in their system. But there was a reason for the fear, right? Yes, because they saw the, that, because Satan showed them that um, the Canaanites were so big physically and they, were, and they saw that and they didn't, think about how big God was. They were just focused on how big the Canaanites were. But God was invisible. Yeah. So and what about the Canaanites? <laughs> they were f physical. Okay. So what does that teach us in life? Well, how would that relate to you and to, me? I, th I think that to me that shows that um, sometimes in the physical world, there will be evidences or feelings that make me feel like that make me, uh, there'll be evidences or feelings that are contrary to God's truth. And that is what our trials and tribulations mean, that even though God is there, and even though God's laws are there, there'll be physical things and physical circumstances and physical pressure that will make me feel doubt, or that will make me feel discomfort and not strong and courageous in God. Well, it doesn't really mean that it will make you feel like that. It's your will. You remember we spoke about the willpower. It is your will that will decide either 
it will convince you or it will not convince you. But the fact is that in life, there will be circumstances or instances or situations when physical evidences could be much more overwhelming over the truth. That is to say, it is possible for the truth to be overwhelmed by physical evidences. That also means that it is possible that the truth will be subdued by the sheer majority or the quantity or the size of physical evidences. It also does mean that the truth could often be in the minority. So, majority does not equate to truth. truth. What about overwhelming physical evidences? Also, does not always point to the truth. So, when you go to churches where people are always saying, we have many people here maybe, that doesn't always talk about the truth. Or when you go to churches where people have over, overwhelming signs and wonders and miracles, does that always indicate the truth? Well, if you go to my country where I come from, it is the size of the crowd or the outrageousness of the miracles that carry the day. Because people don't know that the truth is always, almost always subtle. The truth is almost always non-violent. Not as aggressive and as violent as physical evidences are. And what people don't often know is that the truth is not always evidently visible to the physical eye as much as the physical evidences are. So it means that the giants that those spies saw were too overwhelming for them. They were too convincing evidence for them because they had the word of the Lord, but the word of the Lord was not visible. But the giants were real. So they fell for the physical evidences. So my question to you is, what is that teaching you? When you go to your school or your classroom or your college and you are the only one person who is a Christian in the class or in the school, you are in the minority. Or you have all the people in the class or in the school so lousy and so big and so noisy and so evidently stronger and more imposing, telling you that whatever you believe is rubbish, and there is nobody to stand with you, to side by you, and is that enough a reason to take their arguments as the truth? Or what, how, what is this lesson teaching you? Because, yes, they came back, and there were only two people standing, ten, majority were against them, they believed that the evidences, the alternative evidences were more convincing than the truth. But at the end of the day, we know what happened to the ten people. They didn't enter the promised land. And the two people were the only ones who entered the promised land. So how is that going to help you? That's my question to you, girl, to you guys. How is that going to help you when you go to college or in the street? or at work, or in school, or in your classroom? Anybody want to answer that question? How is this example going to help you to stand for your truth as against the overwhelming and the more convincing physical, material evidences uh, of the opposing camp? Uh, <clears throat> When I'm going to be in an environment where I seem alone, to be standing alone, going to be the only one who believes in Jesus Christ, and if I'm going to be told that what I believe in is a lie, 
and the image will be provided with alternative facts and evidence. I'll know that they, they don't know what they're talking about, whereas I do. <clears throat> I know what I believe in. I've believed in it my whole life, and I've confirmed it for myself, and I've had gone through things that they haven't gone through. And why would they tell me about what I believe in when they don't believe in it themselves? Um, and they're just human, and God is not human. He's so much greater than human. And God is in me, in my heart, all the time, every day, and I can talk to him anytime and confirm his existence anytime. But also, if I feel some exceptionally weak some days, I can still contact my friends who are maybe not in the environment, but through the internet, technology, for support. But that's what I'll use to stand strong. Okay, you have any uh, examples of experiences like this already? Or you want to think about instances of things like this that could happen in the future? Like if I go to an unchristian college, it could happen. Okay. Uh, when I went to boarding school, not everybody there was a Christian. And some people who said they were Christian weren't acting Christian like. Some of them were. That was when you went to boarding school in Africa? Yeah. Okay. Some of them were convincing me to try to swear because they never heard me swear before. They never? Heard me swear before. Okay. It was unusual to try to get me to swear. So those are examples. Okay. Any other person is do you th any other person want to answer that question? How do you think this example could help you in your life? Okay. No more no more examples. No more examples on that. Okay. What about let me give you another kind of reality that makes people to also change their position of truth. Like I said, one of the reasons why people reject the truth and put pressure on you to reject the truth that you know is because of situation and circumstances. Let me give you another example when the truth is clear, but people reject the truth. That is another example is like in the case of the children of Israel as well. And with the children of Israel, uh, you remember when they were in the wilderness? And in the wilderness, they were always having one crisis or the other. Either there was not enough food, there was not enough water, or there are some challenges in front of them. And they feel like they are going to die, really die in the wilderness. How many of you remember what some of them started saying to Moses? Yeah? Or you want to talk, you've not spoken. What were some of them, what did some of them start saying to Moses? Um, they were like grumbling and, and murmuring and saying that they wanted to go back to Egypt instead of continuing on in walking through the wilderness because they didn't think that the situation would get any better than it was. At... Oh, should I repeat it? Does anybody remember more concretely some of the things that they were saying to Moses? Okay, please come. Well, whenever they went through trouble in the wilderness, first of all, they said that, um, well, that Moses was evil for taking them out of Egypt and bringing them there because they were safe in Egypt and they had no problems in Egypt. But now that they had come out, all of these problems had arisen. So they start kind of uh, deforming and distorting images of the past in their heads just because they were so upset at, the cur at their current discomfort. Yeah, what, what were they saying? What were they some of the sentences they were saying that reminds them of the play, the, what they wanted to do? They said that we should have gone back to Egypt because we were eating until we were full there. We had all the water we had to drink, and we could just be... What are some of the food they were mentioning? Uh, meat, and um, meat until you were full, and wine, and bread. Concomba, they didn't talk about bread. Cucumba, and uh, what's it called? She's not. Garlic. garlic, cucumba, garlic. You know, we had all those things in Egypt. That's what they were saying. So what does that teach us? That teaches us that all of us have the tendency to be weak in front of 
challenges and weaknesses. So, you, you know, you have the truth, you know the truth, but alternative or opposing evidences, like how you are eating in Egypt, how you are satisfied in Egypt, how the life in Egypt was better, and how you had everything in Egypt, could be an overwhelming evidence, an overwhelming uh, argument to want to make you reconsider the truth. So what are they, what, oh, that is another reason right there, another reason that makes people to want to go back or reject the truth is because of temporary difficulties, because of challenges. Okay, for example, in my country, Nigeria, many people will tell me that the economy is bad and things are difficult in the country. Because of that, it is understandable if we compromise the truth. For example, lie, steal, steal somebody's, you know, use, be fraudulent, uh, do a scheme, a fraudulent scheme, use cunning way to make money, uh, be dishonest, you know, compromise principles just because you want to make money. Why? Because there is no other way to make money. There is, there are no money in town. There is no money in the city. So, you can understand. You should understand. Now, the question I have for you is, are, is or are difficulties enough reason to, re, to reject the truth and look for alternative evidences? Anybody wants to talk about that? Judah? Are you raising up your hand? No? Okay. Anybody want to talk about that? You again? Okay, come out. How will you argue that situation? Well, I'll say not because, first of all, I'll say that because I think my truth comes from God and that the truth that we should follow should come from God, that Jesus... So our truth is not dependent on how we feel. Truth should not be dependent on your feeling. And truth should not be dependent on the situation. Truth also should not be dependent on the circumstances. Truth cannot be dependent on how you are feeling, how either you are feeling bad or the thing is going to be bad for you or good for you. Truth is above you. Truth is above your feelings. Truth is above your circumstances. Truth is above your profit or your reward or your losses in this situation. Truth is always above and paramount and absolute. So because truth comes from God, even if you are going to die, you should still die on the side of truth. Yes. Oh, I'm hearing your arguments. All right. Um, exactly. And also, if you're experiencing difficulty and you think that for that reason you should be, reconsider truth, that's not an option because truth is something that can't be changed. It's absolute. But your difficulty, it's temporary. And truth and proof of that is that you're feeling uncomfortable. You're feeling like things were better. That means before in your life, you weren't in that difficulty. That means your difficulty is less eternal and it's less significant than the truth. So you can't, so you can't say that the, the truth is tainted or lowered in authority because of this temporary difficulty. It doesn't make sense. And also Jesus, he even went through difficulties in order to save our sins, and save us from our sins, in order to bring us life. Even when his flesh was weak, and even when he did, wanted God to take the cup away, he still went ahead and did he still went ahead and did what he need, needed to do. And because we are made in the image and reflection of God, and we have to emulate Jesus Christ and God, we have no business. It's against the laws of life to ever turn back or to uh, go against the truth in the face of difficulties. Do we have the tendency, though, to, in the, to, to, to weaver 
in the in the in the face of trials and difficulties. Yes, and even Jesus, before um, very close to his crucifixion, had those problems. Okay. Anybody wants to add to that? Yeah, please. Um, I just, it just kind of reminded me of something you were saying earlier about willpower. Um, like how, yes, we do have the tendency to um, like sometimes doubt the truth, but that's just human nature. And we're not perfect, so we can't expect ourselves to... Um, always like how it says in the bible the spirit's willing but the body is weak so even though we may want to like constantly and always 100 percent believe in the truth our flesh because of the physical world and how our physical bodies interact with other people and different circumstances there will be situations in which we have certain doubts so there will always be that tendency to um like doubt and want to run away from the truth but i think we have if we really are true believers in the truth then we'll have the willpower to stick with it no matter what happens because it's 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 like it's like you know it's like almost you know the end from where you are so you know it's going to get better but you just have to go through the middle and get there so if we like, even though it may be difficult, if we, like, push forward and go through with all of our strength and everything that we've got, then it would be less, it would be less of a situation that we turn and run away from it, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. If nobody wants to add to that, or is there anybody wants to add to that? If nobody wants to add to that, let's, uh, I'm going to read from, uh, the story of uh, Moses just to show us how to handle this kind of situation. When we face circumstances or situation when uh, people pr present to us alternative evidences or when they present to us um, no, opposing evidences, opposing proofs, how do we conquer that? How do we you know, you know, how do we defeat the 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 opposing evidences that are rising against the truth that have brought against that are brought against us or against our truth? So uh, let's open the Bible to the book of Exodus, chapter seven. Paul, right, will you come and read to us? Okay. You have your own Bible? Okay. Read uh, Exodus chapter 7 from verses uh, 8 to the end. All right. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went down to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his, and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned the wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing by their secret arts. Each one of them threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed their, up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Okay, in, before we continue to read... What are the principles that you could tell me that is applied by Aaron here and Moses that I told you two days ago? Two days ago, I told you some principles about affirming the truth that is applied here. And how do you conquer and overcome opposing evidences? What you do, one of the things that you can do is that you... What did we see here? They used their, their instruments and tools. Wait. They used what they had. They worked on the... No, they aggressively fought, but... Okay. First of all, they were 
unrelentant in their efforts. They kept on being violent and aggressive. Okay, for example, if I did something normally, if God said, go and perform this miracle, you would put this down, it would become a snake, and naturally, another person comes and does the same thing, naturally what happens to you? You are, de- you are supposed to be demoralized. You are supposed to be, wow, I'm gone. Wow, I'm gone, I'm finished. Wow, I'm finished. That's it. That is the normal, natural response. But instead of responding like that, what did Aaron do? What did Aaron and Moses do? They were unrelentant. Is am I using the right word? Relentless. Relentless. No, no. They 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 didn't they didn't back 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 out. Unrelenting. Unrelenting. Yeah, they were not. Re- they didn't relent. They were unrelenting in their efforts. They intensify. You remember we spoke about intensity. They intensified their efforts. They became aggressive. They became more aggressive in their truth. They became aggressive in affirming the truth, and they also became unrelenting in. Their efforts. They knew that God is on their side. They knew that their truth is superior. So they were reaffirming their confidence in their truth. They were unshaken. Yesterday I spoke to you about even when those kind of things happen, you just laugh and relax. Even if there, there is an overwhelming evidence that's against you, peace, your peace, your confidence is paramount. They maintain their peace. If they had not maintained their peace, they would have panicked. If not because of their confidence and their peace, they would have doubted. But because they have so much confidence in their truth, and because there is nobody and no argument that could be stronger than God's, because God is superior anyway, that itself is an enough reason for peace for you. So whenever your, I mean, your truth is opposed, and whenever there are even overwhelming evidences against your peace, be more violent in your truth. I mean, against your truth, be more violent in truth because the kingdom of God suffers violence. That, that statement, the kingdom of God suffers violence, means the kingdom of God is in lack of violence. Does it have enough violent people? Does it have enough aggressive people? The kingdom of God is in need of violence. The kingdom of God needs more forceful people. So what you do is to be more forceful in your belief in your truth. What you need to do is to be more forceful in your faith in your truth. What you need to do is to relax and be incessant in your truth. Be persistent with your truth. And be relentless in your truth. And also be, uh, you know, put intensity to your truth. Be persistent with your truth. But not in the physical evidences only. But first of all, you've got to connect that your truth to the source of that truth, where that truth is coming from. And that's where you get the peace from. So the, the, the thing that, let, that happened with Aaron and his sword swallowing the, the snake, I mean his snake swallowing the snake of the magicians and the Wizards and things is because it's not because it dropped, it kept on dropping the snake. I mean, the, 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 the rod. It is because he reconnected in his mind to his source of truth. He saw himself be resting in God and being reassured. He reassured himself in the source of his confidence. So whenever you are speaking your truth, don't ever just use, let your 
faith be based only on your arguments. Don't ever rely, unlike them, only on the physical power that you have, or only on the physical argument that you have and manifestation. Because besides the physical manifestation of your truth, there is somebody standing behind and backing your truth for you. So you must always connect your heart and your spirit to him. Seek, you know, in your mind, in your thought, in your heart. A quick prayer, a quick imagination of you before his presence, a quick reassurance of your confidence in him, a quick exchange of thought with God, a quick, you know, uh, imagination, you know, a quick moment of imagination, imagining yourself before him or beside him. A, a, a quick, you know, uh, refreshing of, your, of his promises that I will never leave you nor forsake you. A quick remembrance of his assurance to you that I'm here with you. Even a quick remembrance of your shadow, that just as your shadow will always be here, he's always here as well. He's just here beside me and with me. So, you connect the connection with heaven and the connection with the Father is even greater than the evidence that you produce. That is where your confidence comes from. And it is when that your contact is intact, when that your relationship is fresh, when that your confidence is based on his abiding presence with you, that is where your overwhelming confidence comes from. That's where your faith in the truth comes from. And it is that your faith and freshness in the truth and faith in him, in the author of that truth, that now produces the evidence, the overwhelming evidence that no force and of the enemy will be able to withstand. So don't just be focused on the physical evidence that you have. Sometimes when we, when we are smart or when we have the proofs and the arguments, we only use the arguments as our defense. We only use the proof and the facts to speak for us. But that is not enough. You always need to be aware that there is somebody standing behind your truth. There is somebody standing behind you, behind your belief, behind your facts that you have, behind your evidences. So that is exactly what you will use to overcome and over, over, overthrow all the other evidences when people come against you Either with uh, pro, you know opposing evidence, or they come with uh, you know other explanations, you know uh, with, with uh, alternative explanations. So let's keep on reading from verse fourteen, chapter Exodus chapter seven, from verse fourteen. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding; he refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out, of, out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile. Take in your hand the staff that was changed into, your, into a snake. Then say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, Let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. But by this you, shall, you will know that, that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile. It will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die. The river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink water. To drink its water. Keep on reading. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood everywhere will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the west vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died. The river smelled so bad that, and the, that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptians and magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace, and did not even take this to heart. All the, all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get the drinking water, because they could not drink the water of the river. Okay. Before I address this situation here, what's your name again? Imisi. Imisi. 
Now, it means see, you are the exact, and other people here, you are the exact illustration, example of, let me see here, here, look here. Because of the, the, the bee flying, a missy is no more listening to what we are doing here. Mm -hmm. A missy, you are not listening to the teaching because you are more afraid of the bee. Yeah? You are more afraid of the bee. So anything that was happening here was no more concerning you. Why? Because you lost focus of the truth. The truth is that there are elderly people here who will take care of it. The truth is that if it, does, if, it does it, if it does not hurt anyone, it will not hurt you. The truth is that you don't have, you, you know, you are safe. Because everybody else is safe. But you are more. That is what happens in life. You are, are more distracted by the alternative evidence, the fear. That's what Satan wants. Satan always wants you to fear and Satan wants you to look more at the fear, at the evidence, the alternative evidence than on the truth. So learn, learn to focus on, on the good side than the bad side. Okay? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. So what, what did we see here? What we saw here is that Satan also kept on doing the bad things. But now, all of you now, the lesson is for you, not for Emisi anymore. I, because the same thing is happening now. You are also supposed to be listening to me rather than to Emisi that is crying. That is not the truth. That is the, the distraction. The truth is here. So you need to focus here. Okay? <laughs> Sydney, here. <laughs> yeah, you need to focus here. So, the truth is that even though the wizards and the witches and the magicians kept on doing the miracles and repeating the same miracles that uh, Moses and Aaron did, Aaron and Egypt were not faced. I mean, Aaron and uh, Moses were not faced. And the evidence that they were not faced is because they maintain their peace because they could maintain their peace because they had their confidence in God. Their confidence was still in God. They kept their peace and that is a sign of, a sign of faith. When you are able to maintain your peace, it means you have faith. You have faith in somebody that is more than anything that is happening in the physical realm. So when things are rough and things look to be against you in the physical realm, Reconnect with God. It takes very fast. It is very fast for you to reconnect to God. Just a second. Less than a second. God is ever present here. Just turn your thoughts to him. Switch your mind to him. And cover. Put yourself under his cover. Once you have done that, put your confidence in him. Then they could walk out. They actually went out from there. You need that? Are you okay? They went out from there. And because they went out from there... You know what happened? God struck. You know, without their presence. They didn't need to be there anymore. And God struck. God spoke for them. Even though they had left the stage, but the God that they had confidence in, and because their confidence was still in God, God cleared the situation, spoke on their behalf, even when they had gone, but they maintained their peace and they maintained their faith, and that their faith made God to work for them. So that's an example of how you all are supposed to behave when you face situations and circumstances when you are in the minority or when there are overwhelming evidences against you, against your truth, or when they are, you know, when you don't have arguments anymore. You know what to do. You are, first of all, connecting to God, who is your source, who has sent you, and from there, you act and you are more persistent, you are more aggressive, you are more, uh, you know, cons consistent, inst you know, with what you are doing, uh, more, mm, you are, you know, you, be, you are more persistent in affirming the truth, in affirming 
the truth. Okay. Uh, before, you know, let's, let me give you some more examples of this lesson that we are learning. Yeah. Let's look from the example of Jesus. In John chapter 8, verse 31 to 38, John chapter 8, verse 31 to 38, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. You see, they answered him, we are, they are bringing alternative evidence right there. They are bringing opposing proof, opposing evidence. You are nothing. Your truth is nothing. We don't, can't, we don't respect your truth. Because we have an alternative proof. We have an uh, uh, opposing evidence. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered and said, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. But a son abides forever. Therefore, you see, Jesus is using the same principle. He keeps on being persistent. He keeps on being aggressive. He keeps on affirming the truth. He keeps on establishing, cons consistent with the truth and his position of, he's being aggressive with them. He's being violent, even with truth. You remember when we spoke about violent love? I mean, no, what, aggressive love? Aggressive truth? Aggressive peace. This is, these are the principles here. Aggressive truth ag is establishing and proclaiming the truth aggressively. And the slave does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father. You see? He is not backing up. He is, and also, you see what I said, his confidence is in the Father. I do what I see my Father do. I speak what I've seen with my Father. You see, he's connecting himself back to the source of truth. That is his source of confidence. He's not relying on his words. His source of confidence is not his proof, his facts, his arguments. But he's connecting back to the source of Go to the father that sends him. So, I speak what I have seen with my father. And you do what you have seen with your father. So, that is how the victory will come to you. Amen. Always get back and connect yourself back with the father in your heart. While you are presenting the evidence and the truth, but in your spirit, in your mind, in your heart, behind your back, you are connecting with God. Let me give you another evidence. John 5.43, John 5.43. He says, I have come in my father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. You see, Jesus knows, uh, he, has, he is the truth, he has come with the truth, but Jesus knows that people will always try to come with opposing, or alternative evidence, or opposing proofs. And opposing facts. So he said, be ready for this. Don't let this surprise you. When you come with the truth, somebody will come. He said, another one will come with his own name. With his own truth. And that you will receive. He's, so he's warning them, if you don't receive the truth that I bring to you now, somebody else will come with the fake. With the fake truth. With the alternative truth. With, with alternative evidences. And... Because you have, received, you have rejected the original, you will be compelled to receive the false and the, the deception. John, John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 7 to 8. The first gospel of John, not gospel, the first, uh, the first epistle of John, chapter 2, 7 to 8. It says, brethren... I write no new commandment to you, 
but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. So we don't, we don't, we don't change our position on the truth. We don't play games with the truth. We don't begin to change our mind. But that is what the ten spies did. They, they tried to change their truth to match with the circumstances on the ground. But see what John is saying here. No, we are not giving you a new commandment. No, we don't have a new truth. It's still the same old religion. It is the old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which we, you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So we're not giving you, we're not going to change our position on the truth. We're going to abide by the truth. So that it's been consistent here. It's been consistent. It's been pump, no, constant. It's been, you know, it's been, it's, it's been aggressive. It's been, uh, it's been constant. It's, it's showing persistence, character. Perseverance is persevering with the truth. And that's what we need to do when we are faced with situations like that. Okay. Let me hear a few words from what you have learned from today. I want to hear your thoughts about what you have learned from this passage and from this message today about uh, contrary truth or contrary proofs, contrary evidence to your truth or opposing evidence to your truth. Okay, Judah, you want to talk? What are the lessons you've learned from this uh, class today? Um, people that people may Speak come a bit up, louder. People may um, come up with like may use authority, may yes. use like that. Physical for, evidences, yeah, proofs. The authority to like um, make sure that your truth is not make sure that your truth is not heard. Yeah, and that we should stand by our truth, even though they they kind of have their evidence is not real. You do you have any example, or do you have? Can you tell me how we stand for our own truth? Um. Do you mean give evidence? Or yeah. Um, like, there was um, this, this is an example. There was this, like, film of how people were being prosecuted because they said um, God's name in a school. And they started um, saying how um, other religions, and we don't want um, you to be talking about it but then the other religions are talking about their own religion and nobody had a problem with it but when the christians start talking everyone started to have a problem with it and then there was this one girl who who brought that up and was saying why um why the difference be, um she pointed that out and then and then <laughs> I'm here. You are safe. You are safe. <laughs> that is the evidence right there. <laughs> that, the evidence, physical, practical test for you. That's a test for you right there. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you are scared also, huh? Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's okay. You are safe. You are safe. It's not coming back. Don't worry. Well, well, oh, you forgot. <laughs> <laughs> she brought up the Christians. Some Christians brought up. They've had a problem with other religions. They're talking about their religions. They have no problem. They went out to the other one. They went out to the other one. Okay, don't worry. You try it. Give me five. Let me give you. You try it. <laughs> okay, anybody wants to, anybody wants to help him? Anybody? Okay, let Joy come and help you. <laughs> um, what I learned was that um, people um, fear what they can see, and but they um, but they don't fear what they can't see. Like um, 
the devil uses physical things to scare people. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, you shouldn't fall for the devil's tricks. I, I think you should, like, help, um, ask God for help, like, to identify whether it's a trick from the devil or um, something else. Um, and, um, or... I think God should, um, like, you should ask God for help so that um, you know which one's right and which one's wrong. Because without God, you, like, you're nothing. And, um, yeah. That's so good because you remember this situation with the 10, ten uh, uh, spies? They were afraid and they changed their mind about the truth because of the physical things they saw. They saw the giants and they saw the, the fact that they were stronger in the physical than the children of Israel. But you're right because the children of Israel had God on their side. Even though God was not physical, it was not visible. So they were supposed to believe in God more because that is their truth and their truth is actually bigger than the army that they saw of the enemy but because physical things kind of scare people more and they believe more in the physical things they fell for it instead of standing on the phys on the invisible evidence of god that is on their side so beautiful <laughs> thank you thank you Yes? Yeah, you call me for it. Oh, okay. Well, my main, the main thing that I derive from this message is that physical circumstances, they aren't as important as they feel to us to be. And um, since we're humans and when we first come, everything we experience is physical. And just because the flesh experience everything physically that's hard for us to understand because we feel pain more physically and just the physical realm is a big deal for any human but n now i understand that everything physical is also ephemeral and it won't last forever and that um behind everything physical there is something there is something invisible even if you have a truth and there's so much physical pressure on it, the reason that there's so much physical pressure on it is because that's Satan trying to fight the, um, the absoluteness of the truth with all that physical power. So I th th think that it's, go it's going to be really hard sometimes to stand, in the, stand and not waver in the face of physical um, pressure, but... We also have this tool. We can reconnect with God. And I'm glad that you just even clarified that it could just be a quick prayer. Because, um, because uh, I don't think that God is something that is uh, always far away or always like sometimes av available and sometimes unavailable. I think that if we're living for truth, then God is our source. Then God is what we're living for. And we have every right to we have every right to enlist God's help whenever we need it because we're f serving him and we're fulfilling his purpose on earth so when we're fulfilling his purpose on earth and because of that the world is pushing down on us and pushing down on us and pushing down on us even though it's hard not to focus on the physical still we have God we can do everything anything that we need to to renew our confidence it, it, Renew our confidence in him, and then, and that will keep us. When we, when we are always coming to God, not being anxious as our first instinct, not looking at physical things at our first, as our first instinct, but coming to God, thanking him, praying him, asking him for his strength, then his peace will become a presence in us, and then we'll continue to keep going and doing what we're supposed to do. And I think that's just a process we'll all have to go through and something we'll all have to learn to do 
So I'm very happy for this practical help, and I'm very glad for these practical examples. We need to know that just because something is true, that doesn't mean it's going to be accepted. Jesus told us that, but our truth, it doesn't vary according to, what, to whether or not people accept it or not. It was here before we were the, there, because in the beginning was the word, and our truth is still the word, and it will be there after us. So while we're here, we just have to stand strong in the word, and we have to connect to our source. And yeah, I also found God revelation that our truth isn't just sustained by physical, by physical um, facts. So even when we're not being pressured physically, we shouldn't just believe in God because of the physical proof that we have. We should have, we should feel that God is our source, and that, and we should feel assured in God. We shouldn't just look at the reflections of God that we have. We shouldn't just look at the physical things and see, like, see, God gave me these things. Then, of course, I believe in God. Of course, I love God. We should just know that God is God and always find our, find our reassurance in him only, even when everything else seems hectic. So will you connect, can you easily connect that with uh, why Jesus would normally refuse to bring out physical miracles and evidence when people demand of him, when they put pressure on him that if you are the son of God, you should do some f- miracles. And normally he would, he, when they are asking him to do that, that's exactly when he would not do it. He will, you know, shy away from that and say, no, God is still God. Either I do the miracle or I don't do the miracle. Mm-hmm. And, or when he was being asked to turn the you know, stone to bread, and he knew that is not what affirms God. Those are not the things that they don't affirm truth. That if the truth still remains the truth, even if he doesn't do that. So it doesn't need, when you know the truth, the power of the truth, and you have your confidence in truth, you know, physical manifestations and evidences, they don't always affirm that truth. The truth that you have should be superior to anything physical. So sometimes the physical uh, evidences will be will, could be overwhelming on the side of the opponent, you know, like uh, with uh, the spies and with uh, the pressure of lack of you know food and on the Israelites and the, the physical pressure was much more stronger, much more overwhelming than the truth of God's presence that was not even visible at all, and that's the same reason why they came up with the golden calf. Because the physical need of the, the present need of today, they were much more overwhelming to them than the God that they couldn't see. But really, the truth is they didn't need to put any calf up to prove the presence of God there. God's presence was actually as real, if not more real, than the calf they were going to put up. So those are all lessons that God is trying to teach us, that our truth does not have to be in the physical uh, material manifestation like, you know, the world will always like to see. Because we don't walk in the flesh by what we see, but we walk in the spirit by what we don't see. So God is in the spirit. And like you said something when you were answering right now that uh, even a quick prayer would do. But I would like to correct that and say, maybe you didn't get it. It doesn't have to be prayer at all. It could only be it's a, just a reconnection. It's just like right now. Can you right now switch on and think of where mom is? Yeah. Can you just connect with that as quickly? Mm-hmm. Just the same way you could connect with mom is at home. Or mom is in the room. And you could see the picture of mom. Or you could see the picture of her room. That is quick connection. That is already as strong as any prayer. The same we should be doing with God. So whenever you are in any situation, any moment, any day, any moment, you should always practice the presence of God like that. As quick as that. He's here with you. And you don't always have to think God is over there in heaven. He's not. He's here yeah. now with you. So that's why you know, the, just the awareness is already prayer. That awareness is as strong as any prayer. Okay. That connection, yeah. Yeah, so the most important thing you should learn to do is to always connect with him like that. 
So that way, when you are walking in the street, you are with him. When you are eating, you are with him. Because it said in that day, you will know that I am in you and you are in me. So he's both in you and both overwhelming you. You are in him. So anytime, just connect with that. Anytime, just exchange some thoughts, some uh, memories, some touch. It's all about contact. Just like you have electricity, it makes contact. That contact is the power with God. Always maintain that contact with him. That overwhelming presence of his. That is your assurance. And the more you, you, you maintain that constant contact with him, relationship and his, of his presence, you, it's called practicing the presence of God. The more you practice his presence like that, the more you will realize another thing, Paul. You will realize soon that the physical evidences lose their grip on you. They, don't, they are not overwhelming to you anymore. Because you have practiced his presence so often and so regularly on daily basis that you don't notice any longer the things you see physically, they are no more authority to you. They are no more controlling to you. They, you, don't, you don't even pay. For me, for example, the, the presence of God like that, the overwhelming awareness of God's presence, for me, is much more real. And you will tell. You can tell that. It's much more real than you, my children. You know that. If, yeah, you know by looking at me every day, you live with me. So you will discover that that overwhelming presence of being with God, with me 24 hours, it's much more real than my church, my success, my friends, people around me. You could get to that point whereby the presence, the overwhelming presence of God will be much more real than your wife, your, your, your husband, than your children, than anything in the world. Talk less of people's, people's attacks or, or overwhelming evidence of the opposition. That is just ignored. But you are so affirmed and so established in his presence and in the truth of God with you, that nothing sways you. I don't know if you got it. Yes. And I think that's a great lesson. I think that, like, I think that, yes, the physical realm isn't, isn't all that big because God is the source. Um, of course, it's very good to have water, for example. Like, if we have water right now, that's very good. But if there was no source, then where would that water be? It wouldn't be either. So everything we have in the physical realm, it's, it's just a small part of what we, c we have in God. Because God is the source of everything. And it says in the Bible that every good and perfect gift is from above. And, you know, God is everywhere. It doesn't have to be from, a God, from above. But the point is that God is above everything. And that, so we should, I, I want to get to the point where because God is so much above everything and because I am so aware of God's presence and I know that it's God before me, God beside me, God within me, God in the hearts of every man who thinks of me, um, I don't need to worry about what's physical at all because it's just, it's just so small compared to God. Um, maybe it's easier if you imagine yourself in God's presence, like you know that God would be so vast and on his throne and um, it, just like nothing can compare to him. But it's the same exact thing here. If God was sitting here, then we wouldn't be looking at anything else. We wouldn't be looking at each other. We wouldn't care. We wouldn't care even if there was like some shootings going on, going on yep. outside just yep. because God would be here. He'd be here. And we just, that, that would be the only thing that matters. And that's how we have to live our day-to-day -day life. And, of course, I mean, I never even realized that. Even though Jesus does say that, and that's why he told us about the day and hour where nobody knows, so that we can always be living as if Jesus is already here. It's still a very big and shocking revelation, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah, every minute, every second. Every minute, every second. Okay. I see that the kids are very concerned about the flying bees and uh, insects. And, uh, okay, anybody want to add to what we've said so far? Or oh, you are done? Okay. Uh, uh, Jeanette, yeah? Jeanette? Okay. Um, I just quickly want to go back to um, when we were talking about the spies that went and to Ken. I went back while you were speaking quickly to numbers. 
um, and I read how um, the, the one of the ten who doubted um, said that nevertheless, even though there was milk, there was honey, the land was flowing with fruit, etc. That um, he said, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. Um, and then um, he talked about how they were not as strong as the people who were there. Um, and then, like, I reflected on what you had said about we have to almost, like, throw yourself in God and be surrounded by his overwhelming presence. Yeah. Don't look at your your strength and think that you, you're not as strong. It's not about your strength. It's about the strength of God, which is so much greater than man. So nothing can harm you. Like, yeah. Like that. We all need that confidence. It's all, uh, it should be an ever-abiding presence and awareness, constant awareness. And that is what personal relationship with God is based on. Personal relationship should be based on that awareness, constant awareness of practicing, the act of practicing his presence. If you, if you want to know more about this, I spoke about this uh, on my series on prayers that's called the prayer series if you go to youtube sunday adelaide official the home page you can you know look through the series one of them is called the prayer series and in that prayer series i spoke about practicing the presence of god and also in the kingdom series so those two series will help you and will bring more awareness of the presence of god to you than uh, you know, so that you know more of that, uh, on, you know, every day, on daily basis, on every, every minute of your day, than on any other reality that is trying to impose itself upon you. So the awareness and the presence of God should always be superior to any other awareness that is trying to, you know, yeah, put you under his control and command. Well, Kate, I guess I will be with you two, or two, two, or two times or more tomorrow. I don't know. But at least I will be with you tomorrow in the day, in the morning, and in the evening for sure. So uh, we'll be back. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Who is in charge? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now go practice it. Go practice it. Thank you. Thank you.